Okay, well, we'll just keep rolling. Um, welcome to the second installment of the Wedgwood International Seminars Zoom Lecture Series. We anticipate a large audience today as we did in our first lecture. In our first lecture, during our first lecture, we had over 145 participants. If you missed that lecture, or if you would like to view it again and listen to Anne's lecture on Clay Layton again, please visit the website and our Facebook page for the link to the video, which is on YouTube. Just a quick few words on how we're going to conduct the meeting today. Dr. Anne Forshla Tarish will speak today as our, she will be, excuse me, she will be our moderator. She will introduce our speaker, Lucy, and the lecture will be followed by a question and answer session. Please remember that while you're listening to Lucy to type your questions into the chat box at the bottom of the screen, and Anne will um, look at them at the end. And for the moment, let me just uh, refer you to the slide for a minute. You can see that in order to become a WIS member, you can go to our website and get a link for the application. And to support us, you might want to donate some money to help us with these lectures. And you see the link there. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Anne, who will introduce our speaker. Yeah, thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon. I think we all know Lucy Led uh, from the Wedgwood Museum. She was actually born and raised in the canal town of Stone, just a few miles from the factory. And she's always had an, uh, an interest in the history of the area. And she pursued then her bachelor's degree at the University of Liverpool and got her master's in international archives, records and information management at Oh, I don't think I can pronounce this, Lucy. You're going to have to say the name of the university. Aberystwyth. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, and so her master's dealt with um, looking at ceramics as a way of understanding heritage. She began working for the Wedgwood Museum, or actually volunteering at the Wedgwood Museum in 2012. And in 2015, she was appointed archivist. And she has been a great help to to all of us who are researching Wedgwood and um, interested in the factory archives. So thank you for all of that work, Lucy. And today, Lucy is going to be talking to us about, uh, the title of her talk is A Wedgwood Missionary Trip, which is kind of an intriguing title. So we will learn more about what Wedgwood was doing in the early part of the 20th century. So everyone, please welcome Lucy Ludd. Well, um, thank you very much for that uh, wonderful welcome. And um, it's so lovely to see so many people from all around the, uh, every corner of the globe actually tuning into this tonight. So that's, um, that's very exciting. So if you can just bear with me two seconds while I work out the uh, technical side of sharing my screen. Portion um, of a screen. So, excellent, right. So, um, probably around um, a year and a half ago, um, whilst no doubt looking for something entirely else in the archives, I happened to stumble across um, a report written by John Goodwin, the art director for the company in 1913, about the Marshall Field exhibition, which has taken place in Chicago. Attached to the back of this report was a listing of 101 different items from the Wedgwood Museum's collection, which were displayed along an array of current production. I filed this under a mental heading of something different and carried on. Then a few months after that, whilst digging um, for an article in the Australian Wedgwood Review, I came across Richard Smith's article on the 1914 Wedgwood exhibition in Sydney. And once again, the figure of 101 items loaned from the museum jumped out at me, as it seemed to indicate a similar sort of display, a mixture of old and new items um, exhibited together. It was not until um, last year, um, in about, I think it was uh, perhaps September, um, that I had an inquiry from Graham Huber, so my thanks to him for setting me off on this thread, about an unusual Portland vase which he had owned. 
and could I tell anything, him anything else about it? So out of this chance question, this entire talk has evolved. So this is um, Graham's vase, and I, I could find very little um, other than the odd passing reference to the Marshall Field exhibition, which uh, it relates to. Um, I could find fractionally more on the Sydney one, but nevertheless, I think they are two very interesting exhibitions which came about through a concerted effort by Wedgwood in the early years of the 20th century to massively increase their overseas markets, which considering the huge, over, um, huge global disruption, which was only a matter of months away with the outbreak of the First World War, was incredibly fortuitous. Throughout much of the 19th century, Wedgwood was reliant on a network of travellers crisscrossing Europe and indeed the British Isles to bring back orders from further afield. However, as the century progressed, Wedgwood would take part in a wide variety of national and international exhibitions. By no means a comprehensive list, there were such exhibitions at the Great Exhibition in London in 1851, Cologne in 1865, London again in 1871, Paris in 1878, Sydney in 1879, Melbourne in 1880, Paris in 1889, Chicago in 1893, Brussels in 1910 and Turin in 1911. All of these provided a forum in which to show off new designs and wares but crucially meet new customers. Their usefulness was sometimes questioned uh, comments made by Godfrey Wedgwood in 1879 indicated that he saw the Australian market and the resulting exhibitions held there as a potential way to move, quote, cheap and showy things, or in other words, um, offload unfashionable and outdated goods to faraway markets. So despite... Um, um, Godfrey Wedgwood's less than flattering view of the Australian market, Wedgwood did make an effort. Through their agents, Thomas Webb and Sons, an impressive display was accumulated and a picture of the Wedgwood exhibition um, at Melbourne has survived, which is shown on the screen at the moment. Um, and actually we can trace the history of some of these items. So um, let's move forward, um, such as this one at the back, which is um, the swan vase decorated by John Holloway, which is now on display in the Museum of Applied Arts and Sciences in Australia. And if you do study the picture, you can actually spot a number of um, quite interesting, very highly decorated pieces that were sent out to Australia at the time. Similarly, and thanks to the wonders of the internet, um, this picture has sort of recently um, sort of been uncovered. Now, I believe this image to be the Wedgwood stand in the um, 1893 World Columbium exhibition, uh, which took place in Chicago to celebrate the 400th anniversary of Columbus crossing the Atlantic. Similarly, an impressive display of items was also assembled. So you can see yet again, another swan vase making a an appearance, this time decorated by Thomas Allen. Um, but you can also make out another um, um, other pieces. So you can just about sort of see um, a bridled horse plate uh, designed by Colonel Creelock um, down in the bottom right hand corner of this piece. And again, um, down towards sort of like the centre at the bottom, you can see a number of um, replica vases um, that were sort of reproduced as um, or from ancient terracotta ones that were discovered by Dr. Schleiman from what was believed to be the ruins of Troy. However, also visible is the magnificent Wedgwood inlaid cabinet designed by Charles Toft for the 1878 Paris Exposition Universelle, which you can see is full of jasperware vases and topped with a black basalt figure of Minerva looking down upon it all. 
Now you may be wondering why I've spent some time exploring these two images taken 20 and 34 years prior to the two exhibitions I want to focus on in the 1910s. And the reason was why. Why did Wedgwood suddenly decide to, to undertake these two smaller exhibitions with such an unusual combination of goods in two department schools thousands of miles away, which was not actually connected to an international fair of some description, especially as there had been a number of European international fairs in the years um, just preceding that. I would argue that that was precisely the reason that Wedgwood undertook this. Um, that it had been 20 to 30 years prior and Wedgwood had only um, and Wedgwood exhibited nothing in any sort of great way in these countries since then. So for instance one of the triggering factors behind sending these items out to the United States and Australia was a way in which to sort of recapture these markets but also to get a better understanding of what these markets wanted. Why not, for instance, choose a department store in New York to undertake such an event? After all, the Wedgwood office in New York had opened in 1906 under the supervision of Kennard Wedgwood. Now, unfortunately, letter books from this period from the directors of the company have not survived. So a clear answer is hard to come by. But I do wonder if they felt that they'd had success in Chicago with a platform um, in which they could engage with a wide variety of potential retailers and buyers, why not try it again? And of course, it cannot do any harm to all to get on board one of the largest department stores in the US to be your home. There we go. Um, the same could be said for the um, Australia visit. The Wedgwood exhibition at Sydney had then formed part of the International Fair at Melbourne, so perhaps more of a travelling show may be better suited to the geography and population centres of Australia, and again calling at one of the largest department stores in the country. As far as I can tell, the idea of combining a selection of both old Wedgwood items from the museum with an array of new items um, of production had actually come about in 1910. Um, in 1910, Wedgwood exhibited at the Brussels exhibition, and they did so with a standard selection of current Wedgwood production and the few new developments that had been made, along with five 18th century vases, which had been lent by the museum. The museum had been founded at four years earlier, and I think the idea of combining the two in a way which heritage the, um, highlighted the heritage of the company seemed very logical, but also even quite modern by our standards today, as it ensures that the customer could buy into a brand based on tradition and high quality craftsmanship. A notebook at the time, um, I'm sorry, a note at the time in the director shareholder book. Uh, wrote that they wished to record the, con the continued success of the museum as a means of advertisement for its unique, um, for its means of, as a means of advertisement, it is unique and all visitors are impressed. And for the most part, the Brussels exhibition of 1910 was a success and Wedgwood walked away with the highest accolade of all of a Grand Prix um, as a result of their efforts and display. However, disaster was to strike and on the night of the 14th of August, a fire started and gutted much of the English pavilion, as well as significant proportions of the French and Belgian displays as well. Wedgwood, and indeed many other companies, I do hasten to point out, lost significant quantities um, of items and there were large insurance payouts made to recompense people for the loss of these items. But despite this very discouraging ending uh, to an otherwise successful venture, I do believe Wedgwood felt they cottoned on to something that if they combined old and new, they could actually it be actually something that could be very successful for them. But at the risk of getting too ahead of myself, I think we need to explore what was happening at Wedgwood as well at the turn of the 20th century, and even more broadly, understand what was happening in the rest of the Staffordshire Potteries industry at that time. It's been well documented that the last years of the 19th century and into the early years of the 20th were an incredibly difficult period for the Wedgwood Company. 
buffered by international economic uncertainties, a lack of um, artistic direction and several younger members of the family serving abroad in the Boer War, namely that of Cecil and Frank Wedgwood. Um, it actually led to quite a bit of difficulty for the company back at home. In a letter dated March 1902, written by Godfrey Wedgwood um, to Charles Bill, the MP for Leek, he wrote that the result of the absence of the two partners from their respective departments in the works has been brought home to us in a most painful way by the figures of last year's business just balanced. The firm has made a very large loss, such a loss as cannot be contemplated for the coming years without the most serious consequences. Unfortunately, the remedies of the loss cannot even be considered with any effect during the heads of business, um, with the heads of business um, being at war. It cannot be surprising, therefore, that when they both returned to the company full time, it was a moment of great joy. Photographs of the return of Cecil Wedge would have survived. And there's a wonderful account a few months later in June 1902 that a silver salver was in, uh, presented to Frank Wedgwood with the inscription on the occasion of his return from active service in South Africa by the employees of Messrs Josiah Wedgwood and Son. And in the picture on the right hand side of the screen, you can see Cecil Wedgwood standing in the middle of the courtyard um, at Echuria, uh, complete with bunting and flags uh, decorating um, as they welcomed him home. In 1902, uh, with the return of both Frank and Cecil, really marks the start of the streamlining of the Wedgwood business. Many of you will be no doubt aware that this was the year in which um, Wedgwood stopped producing tiles and there are several letters in the archives um, from Cecil Wedgwood writing to other ceramic manufacturers inquiring as to whether they'd be willing or not willing or not to purchase all of the tile machinery, tile press, presses and dies for the sum of £1,000. However, selling off the tile department was not going to be a quick fix and it was a long and drawn out process for the company to regain financial security. Certainly, there are several letters written throughout 1903 by Hope Wedgwood, who was Cecil's um, stepmother and Godfrey's second wife, um, to her daughter, Mary Wedgwood. Now, in between the usual mother-daughter correspondence you might expect, are references to, quote, Frank was overshadowed by the sad work calamity, that father, Godfrey Wedgwood, is very sad about Victoria, and we have to try and keep his mind off it as much as possible. And finally, that Cecil was full of this great question of what to do about the poor old works. He has been working these 20 years and never made a penny, and it is so disheartening. So the way forward, it was decided, obviously, by the directors of Wedgwood at the time, was that a focus on tradition, heritage and high quality decoration was the only way in which Wedgwood would be able to rescue itself as a company. So there is actually an illuminating article from the Staffordshire Advertiser in 1902, which sums up the state of the Staffordshire pot trees in December of that year. And it's important to note that it doesn't just focus on Wedgwood, it looks at the industry as a whole. One of the things that it highlights are the specific, specific demands of the American market, and especially that at present, the Americans send to England for much of the highest class of wear. We learn from time to time that the potters in the States are striving in every way to produce wear equal to that of the best English firms. And actually in the paragraph preceding this, there's a direct reference to the White House service, which is pictured on your screen at the moment, which was produced by Wedgwood in 1902. Um, as one of these sort of like high class pieces of wear. And it had, uh, with the note, it had prompted numerous further orders from wealthy citizens of the United States, the best quality China and the most artistically decorated. So there's definitely a recognition in the US at the time that if you do want high quality pieces, you know, you do have to sort of send uh, to the UK for it. And 
actually what this um, article also does give you some idea of is actually sort of like the, the quantities, the financial quantities of material which is exported overseas um, between the years 1900 to 1902 um, from it. So you can see that um, obviously the USA and Australasia um, sort of remain the highest quantities of export um, material at the time. So what to go into a bit more detail about this um it highlights that um, australia is a very important market but also that germany is still the largest customer for british crockery and that france um, has well, business with france during this year has been well maintained returning to the state of wedgwood and due to the geographical proximity and an increasing awareness that the export market was critical, the early years of the 20th century was set to wooing the French market, particularly with items that were carefully researched to appeal to their tastes. So in 1901, um, a showroom was set up at um, 67 Rue de Hauteville, which was run by C.P. Felton. Cecil Wedgwood um, in these years would become a frequent visitor to Paris to gauge the market. In one letter from 1904, again written to his stepmother Hope, um, it was related that he has been in business in Paris this last week, setting afoot fresh business relationships with Britain shopkeepers. And it goes on to say that um, he'd worked hard four days and allowed himself only to sightsee in the very last day. But according to um, Hope Wedgwood, the worst of it was that Cecil had actually come back from France, very much in love with everything French, saying that they had much better taste than we did and that their art had proceeded on much sounder lines than others even to the point where he was thinking about setting a foot of prize for designers in Paris, so to get a notion of what will be best to cultivate for the French market. But despite Cecil Wedgwood's admiration for all things French, there did remain a problem. Thomas Allen, the chief designer for the Wedgwood Company throughout much of the late 19th century, was rapidly approaching his retirement. What the Wedgwood Company needed according to Cecil in 1902, was, quote, some youngish man who is clever at adapting designs with which we should supply him, and who could, if the venture proved a success, educate hands to work under him. Such a man would be important, Cecil went on to explain, as, quote, the difficulty that we find is that not one out of a hundred of the purchasing public has really good taste. And so long as a thing is new, it may be as ugly as sin. But I suppose this is no new difficulty, but one in which manufacturers have countered with since the year one. So this youngish man who would ultimately fulfil this brief would actually be discovered to be already working at the Wedgwood factory. John Edward Goodwin had joined the company in 1892 in the design department before being appointed as the chief designer in 1904. And actually, there is quite a sea change in the sort of styles of um, plates and patterns that were being produced at this time. And there exists in the archive a list of um, 40 or so patterns produced entirely for the French market in the first case between 1905 and 1917. So retailers such as the Grand Depot had patterns produced for them such as La Normandie, La France and um, Louise made for them. Um, Damien and Delant had patterns such as Personnage, Laurier and Acanthus, again illustrated on the screen. The Pannier Frères sold patterns such as Cheadle and Hewitt, again illustrated. And then finally, the most significant retailer for Wedgwood in France was Rouard and patterns such as Vieux Rouen, Stafford, La Paix and Menency were created for um, um, Rouen by Wedgwood at the time. This isn't a complete list, there are other ones out there, but I just sort of selected these ones at random. 
Now, unfortunately, it's impossible to say to exactly what extent Goodwin had a hand in designing all of these patterns, but certainly he was very adept at both creating new patterns for markets and reimagining old patterns and shapes, which he'd either discovered in various trips he made to the continent. We know that he went to both Paris and Berlin um, and studied items in various museums over there, or indeed had historical pieces of Delphware or Rouen Fayon sent to him by Jules Rouard for him to draw inspiration. So he was getting, in, um, getting his ideas from a variety of places. So I, I do appreciate that this is actually quite a bit of background information, and I've, I have done this in sort of the hope of demonstrating two things. First of all, that Josiah Wedgwood and Sons had spent a lot of time and effort since 1902, really trying to consolidate its export markets in Europe to overcome the economic difficulties that they faced at the beginning of the 20th century. Although they continued to export globally throughout this period and did have some high profile commissions such as the White House service, I would argue that it took probably about a decade them to start feeling comfortable enough to try and actively cater um, actively cater for the differences in taste in North America and Australia and really make significant further inroads into that into their um, export trades. And then the second point I want to make is that is actually through the work of John Goodwin, who was so proficient at designing patterns geared towards the specific demands at home and abroad, which made him well suited to the task um, in hand of an overseas Wedgwood exhibition. Goodwin had travelled on the continent for Wedgwood, taking the opportunity to meet foreign retailers and visiting museums with extensive ceramic collections. And I think that the directors of Wedgwood had similar faith in him that he could produce the same sorts of results in the USA given the right format. So on to sort of like the, the two main exhibitions now at last. Um, Marshall Fields and Company situated in downtown Chicago is today regarded as being one of the most important department stores in American history and was certainly the largest at the time in the country and doing a bit of research about Marshall Fields um, I discovered that this was the first place to actually offer an sort of like in-store restaurant so it was quite putting edge um, for its time. From the records that survive in the archives, on March the 27th, 1913, 101 items from the museum were inventoried, and considering what had happened three years earlier at Brussels, making it even more prudent, all carefully valued before they were shipped across to the United States with an array of current Wedgwood production. Now, one thing, unfortunately, I have not been able to get to the bottom of is to be entirely sure of what quantities of material of current production were also sent along with this shipment. The closest I have found to this um, as an answer is a passing reference in one of the minute books that Wedgwood was quite simply making heavy shipments to Marshall Fields and Company in March 1913. But in terms of any sort of further details, unfortunately that sort of information has since been lost. But amazingly, a catalogue um, of the 1913 Marshall Field exhibition has survived in the archives. And in the first few pages, list the types of wear which were on offer. So there were Queen's wear, Jasper wear, um, and then moving on to sort of like lavender wear and Imperial Queen's wear um, and so on. So certainly the written descriptions of these items heavily emphasise the history of some of these pieces and um, demonstrate how long they've been in production for. But the majority of the booklet is, however, dedicated to the 101 items from the Wedge Museum, which were exhibited alongside. Now, unfortunately, I've not been able to locate a picture of how the display looked in Marshall Fields, but remembering that these items were later shipped to Sydney, where I do have a picture of them on display, I'll explore the specifics of this in a little bit more detail in the next section. What has survived in the archives, however, is Goodwin's 
written report um, of his impressions and experiences in the US in 1913 and it makes for a very interesting reading especially his report on the opening day of the 5th of May. So to quote from Goodwin, the exhibition was open today at Marshall Field um, occupying a wide stretch right across the whole of their china floor with bays on either side, making the most comprehensive display of Wedgwood ware that has ever been shown at one time. The museum specimens filled a square case in the centre of the exhibit and made quite a handsome show, creating a great deal of interest in the variety of things which could be vouched for as authentic and surprised that they could be spared to be on exhibition at Chicago. One of the first um, expressions of visitors was one of astonishment, rather more than surprise, that Wedgwood made so many variety. I thought Wedgwood was only dark blue and white was the frequent expression, and I think many of us perhaps, actually perhaps understand that sentiment still today. Um, this impression we soon disabused them of, and many of them left with promises of coming again. Goodwin would go on to say that they only had a small supply of the lavender with white ornaments, which I actually think is probably a description of embossed queen's wear more so than lavender wear. Um, but this soon proved a first favourite, all pieces soon being sold with orders for future delivery. It does, however, seem a long time, though, when you have to tell a customer that it will take six months to get the goods and it takes two months for transit. Um, Goodwin also took the opportunity whilst he was in um, Chicago to get in touch with what he um, quoted as many prominent and wealthy people who generally wanted something different from what their neighbours had. So that had several drawings executed. Well, I, have, I have no sound, Alan. Uh, you are viewing. Oh, sorry, yeah. Um, so i just go back then. So um, he got in touch with many prominent and wealthy people who generally wanted something different from what their neighbours had, so that he had several drawings to execute as soon as possible. Queens were ornamented, sold well. Imperial ware attracted a deal of attention with some sales being made. Hand-painted ware was slow and so was china, for the fashion at present seems to be for the ornamented earthenware. On the whole, there was a very good attendance with good sales being made. So the positive reaction to the event continued throughout the week. And by Friday, the 10th of May, 1913, when the exhibition was closed, Goodwin reported that it had been a very busy day and quite the best so far with the largest sales made. All the largest Jasper bowls are gone. All the largest pieces of basalt, which included a Warwick vase and wine and water ewers. Um, orders were made for imperial pierce plates, 10 inch sizes of various lavender and whiteware, and a good number of rich ladies coming in again to complete their purchases. Goodwin added that he thought that Marshall Field and Company are feeling that they would like to keep the show on another week, and I think they will keep most of it in position. Um, as the wedge, as the salespeople can talk Wedgwood a good bit now. He did note, however, that the Americans didn't like some things. Um, so, for instance, the Majolica tortoiseshell had not reached particularly sort of high quantities of sales. And again, with the Capri ware that they were creating, that it is slightly more admired than the Majolica, but again, few sales. Goodwin after um, the exhibition closed on the 10th of May, would stay in the US um, for a further week, um, further two weeks, I should say, um, undertaking a variety of engagements. And I think that's probably just, uh, an interesting point to add that I do think he was probably trusted enough to do this because three days into the um, exhibition, exhibition opening in 1913, Kennard Wedgwood, the uh, Wedgwood representative for the company who'd set up the American showrooms, was actually called back to England on the death of his father. So Goodwin was basically left on his own to undertake a lot of the sale by the sound of it and to meet further retailers, to go and visit important people and to actually undertake a series of designs. So I think that's all credit to John Goodwin there. 
He would um, spend time visiting other department stores in Chicago other than Marshall Field, and then he would travel on to East Liverpool, New York and Philadelphia. And along the way, he met museum curators and collectors. Um, he would meet other retailers of Wedgwood stock, um, one of whom berated Goodwin that um, a particular pattern had taken eight months to arrive. But Goodwin also visited the Homer Laughlin East plant and the Newell plant to see how pottery factories operated in the US. All the time he was on a fact gathering mission as to what would and could sell and actually quite a bit does come from this. Putting aside completely the fact that Wedgwood obviously felt that it was enough of a success to make putting a similar outlay of cost to repeat the experience a year later, um, it, it does actually have quite an impact. In the months that follow, in May 1913, in the minutes books again, there are glowing reports of the impact of the exhibition on sales. Um, highly satisfactory and shows considerable improvement on 1912 was one comment. And they actually directly attribute this to um, the field, Marshall Field exhibition. Um, they also reveal that it's been reported there's been a steady improvement during the last few weeks in the orders received, especially the American orders for China. I suspect, although I've not been able to find a specific mention, that Marshall Fields was probably one of the first places in the States where Wedgwood New Powder Blue was actually exhibited after being perfected the previous year. I found an advert in our um, collection which certainly shows that in December 1913 it had made its way over to the showrooms of WH Plummer in New York and I find it hard to believe that they would not have included it in such a significant event for Wedgwood such as this exhibition at Chicago and on screen you just perhaps see a, a variety of um, the powder blue plates that Wedgwood was making at that time. And certainly examples of Wedgwood powder blue with gilt decoration complete with the Marshall Field and Company mark on the reverse are known to exist, such as this set that passed through the hands of Skinners a number of years ago. But other examples of particularly high quality bone china, such as this tea set painted by Joseph Palin Thorley, again with the Marshall Field um, stamp on the reverse, if this tea set was not actually made for the exhibition, especially in 1913, I would think it would have almost certainly would have been made, produced um, to satisfy the um, immediate uptick for American China in the American market. Now, I can put this probably in between 1913 and 1914 because by August 1914, um, Thorley, the decorator, had actually left the company to join up um, during the First World War. So actually there's a very limited time period in which I think we can actually say this was actually produced. The exhibition and Goodwin's visit to the States would have much uh, further implications as well. And a series of patterns were created as a result of his trip out there. One such pattern was Trenton, uh, which was originally designed on Edme shape. Um, Edme was a shape that was originally designed for the French market. And this particular shape was made especially for the US and enjoyed particular success over there. Another example is Belmar of about the same sort of time period. And again, was a joint collaboration between Goodwin and George H. Service, one of the Wedgwood representatives in the States, which had been a signal success. There are a number of others um, which Wedgwood was involved in designing. But I think if you, if you do actually study these and cast your mind back to some of the patterns I showed earlier that were made for the French market, when you compare the two sort of stylistically, they, they are quite different. They're sort of floral basket design as opposed to perhaps more rural country scenes and fancy borders. Um, they do sort of look very different. So as demonstrated by the enormous uptick in sales that has resulted from the Marshall Field exhibition and already aware that Australasia, remembering those figures from 1902 with the, the export um, 
quantities of materials exported, um, aware that Australasia was another market ripe for this sort of treatment, the directors of the Wedgwood Company seemed keen to repeat it. It was interesting the reasons behind why they chose to send Harry Bernard to oversee the programme and report back rather than send Goodwin again. And I would suggest it was probably a combination of reasons. Um, a mixture of wanting Goodwin to remain at Achoria to work on the series of designs inspired from his recent trip to the States, but also the practicalities. Rather than being away from England for just um, a few weeks, the person they would send to Australia would be for, away for a matter of months. So Harry Bernard fit the bill for this both an incredibly talented potter and designer himself. He had been the London showroom manager since 1902 and often combined his work with, um, for Wedgwood with a series of public lectures. So although the main purpose of Bernard's visit was to do exactly the same that Goodwin had done in the US, they do seem to take on quite a different flavour. Both would meet potential buyers and dealers, but Bernard, even more so than Goodwin, went on the charm offensive, meeting a variety of important figures in the developing Australian collector circuit, as well as a number of curators and librarians. Bernard left the UK in um, July 1914, on the 3rd of July, on the RMS Oravito, a steamship which re regularly sailed from the UK through the Mediterranean and Suez Canal. In fact, it was only when the ship was a few hours away from its arrival in Fremantle that news reached the ship of the outbreak of the First World War. According to Bernard's memoirs, after running a run-in, after avoiding a run-in with the SM SMS Emden, a German light cruiser, by the time that he'd reached Perth, he found the city in disarray and nobody seemed particularly inclined to think much about business or willing to host one of his public lectures due to the unfolding drama on the international sh um, stage. Bernard rejoined the ship and travelled on to Adelaide and then on to Melbourne, continually being met with the same response. And so Bernard travelled to Sydney and to the department store of Anthony Hordens and Son. Despite Bernard not being able to lecture in any of the cities he had thus so far visited, it had always been the intention that the first exhibition of Wedgwood items, both old and new, would always have taken part place in Sydney. From there, Bernard could then make his own arrangements and spread the gospel, as he termed it, of all things Wedgwood. He could then arrange further um, talks and sort of arrange further destinations to host um, this exhibition. Hordens would also appear to have been the perfect venue, again being the largest department store in Sydney at the time. And once again, a small exhibition booklet was produced especially for the event. Unlike the Marshall Field exhibition, a number of photographs of the displays at Horden has survived. And I think this is probably about as close as we can get at the moment to imagining how these displays would have looked at Chicago. So I, I did try and spend some time trying to work out how to best show some of these pictures to you without it becoming a little bit too much like an eye exam. So if you can sort of excuse the sort of slightly grainy photographs, um, I've tried to pull in other images as well to sort of illustrate what I'm talking about. So in this first picture, you can make out a series of um, black basalt pieces, including mercury on a rock and one of the vestal lamps um, on this sort of shelving unit at the back. Um, here you can see a selection of silver shaped bone china teaware with what looks like gilt handles um, in a sort of a more central position in the um, hall. And on another table, you can see a, a framed bone china plaque illustrating the variety of different hand painted crests you could order should you choose to have a sort of a monogrammed bone china dinner service um, at the time. Again, a slightly different view of the exhibition hall. And I'm going to go into a bit more detail about some of the images. So down in the sort of the bottom in the centre, you can see um, a selection of both embossed queensware and a number of lithophanes. And you'll have to take my word for it, I'm afraid, but um, right at the very back of the hall, there's a selection of 
various ewers and basins. Again, there's there's quite a selection of sort of um, jugs, again, sort of scattered throughout this particular uh, picture, which are slightly tricky to try and actually show in any great detail at the moment. And then the final uh, picture of the main exhibition hall we can see here. And again, pulling out some key pieces here um, in the sort of the background, you can see um, an apotheosis of home of ours taking pride of place there. Um, in the foreground, there are several tables um, full of jasperware. Um, so there both appears to be um, dark and pale blue jasper that was available for sale um, at the time. And then right at the very, very back, you can actually make out a Portland vase in a display case because you can't really have a, an exhibition of Wedgwood without having a Portland vase in there somewhere. And then again, at the very back, you can make out what looks to me to be a early piece of uh, Daisy McKay Jones's ordinary lustre on a pedestal at the far end of um, the hall. And then finally, there too survives a picture of the loaned items from the Wedgwood Museum. And once again, a copy of the exhibition catalogue for um, this event has survived in the Wedgwood archives. And we can still make out a number of pieces today. So for instance, we can actually see um, the wooden hexagonal vase, uh, wooden block mould uh, designed by John Coward in the 18th century um, in the case. We can quite clearly make out um, the very distinctive swags on this agate decorated vase again in the middle. A little bit harder to see, but again, those sort of uh, vertical lines are quite distinctive. Um, a bull pot of uh, bamboo design um, tucked away in the back corner. And then the last one I just decided to pull out was a framed copy of Ituria Hall and surroundings, um, which again is actually still on display in the museum today. And I could have pulled out any other number of items from that particular case as pieces that we do recognise today as part of the museum's collection. So certainly it all adds up to be a significant financial quantity of material that Wedgwood shipped out to Australia, judging by these pictures alone. And one figure that I found was that in April 1914, three months before Bernard sailed, some £2,300 worth of goods were described as being in hand for this exhibition in Australia. Now in today's money, that's probably not far off £150,000, over US$200,000 or well over a quarter of a million of Australian dollars. Whether more or indeed less um, than that was actually shipped to Australia, it's hard to say because the records actually say exactly what was sent out haven't, hasn't survived. But saying that, we do know that Bernard struggled to put a display together in the first place. With the outbreak of the war, shipping delays caused um, enormous disruptions and the goods that um, Bernard was expecting to arrive very shortly behind him actually arrived um, several weeks behind him, so much so that the exhibition in Sydney was actually delayed by two months and only opened in December 1914. Bernard's problems were further compounded, however, by the fact that further deliveries of goods were now completely out of the question. Whereas Bernard had intended to visit many more cities um, and again sort of get more stock from um, England sent out to him, he eventually was only able to move on to Wellington in New Zealand before returning back to Australia, visiting Melbourne and Adelaide once more before heading back home. However, Bernard did manage a number of lectures once he'd settled in December. He spoke on four different occasions in Sydney alone, one event drawing over 1,500 people. He would go on to repeat this across Australia um, Across 1914 and 1915. His main topic of choice was Josiah Wedgwood, his life and works, and he illustrated this with a selection of some 200 glass lantern slides and 690 foot of cinematic film. Bernard would, only a matter of months after his return to England, write a three-page account of his experiences in Australia for the Pottery's Gazette. 
entitled A Wedgwood Missionary Trip, um, the title of which I've shamelessly plagiarised for the purpose of this talk, does, however, at the end, recount what Bernard had thought about his experiences in Australia and the state of the Australian market. So to give you a, a quote from that, the general impression I formed was that this is a wonderful country having enormous spending power. I feel now that English people, and remembering what Godfrey had said about the Australian market some 30 years earlier, um, Bernard said, have, have grievously misjudged the Australians. The pottery manufacturers in particular have formed the impression that the Australians are not at all particular and will be satisfied with the very cheapest stuff that they can send them. But my tour has taught me something, that this is a market capable of handling the very best things we have to offer them, and they are quite willing to take them and pay for them what we ask. Many, indeed, were the complaints made to me whilst I was over there, that English manufacturers do not even have to stick to their indents, but they have a sort of mania for substituting what suits their convenience, sheltering themselves behind the satisfaction that Australia is too far away for the goods to come back, and that it will be three months at any rate before they hear anything about it. But I am convinced that um, that to do any good in this market, we shall have to give attention quite as careful and quite as considered as we invariably give out to our West End clientele here. It is for the English manufacturers, so he's not just saying for Wedgwood, but it's for all manufacturers of pottery um, in Saffron at the time. Therefore, to exploit um, this market with better class productions and get rid of the fallacious idea that anything will do. If we send the very best that uh, can, if we send the very best we can, it will be disposed of. That is the main lesson of my tour. And certainly back in England, the directors of the Wedgwood Company were similarly impressed by Bernard and his efforts in Australia on their behalf. Reports um, in the minutes books, again from the period, suggest that satisfactory reports have been made on the results of the Australian exhibition, which has so far proved in every way successful. And there are actually a number of interesting pieces that were sold as a result of the Australian exhibition in Sydney. And a number of these pieces were acquired by the Sydney Technological Museum, now the Powerhouse Museum, which sort of falls under the, the broader umbrella of the Museum of Applied Arts and Sciences in Australia. And one of these includes this hand-painted series of Australian flower plates, um, again on with powder blue decoration, painted by Arthur Dale Holland at the time. Um, but there also exists a black basalt vase and a, um, an Apollo and five of the muses in the collection. But again, there are some very nice pieces of lusterware which um, live in the museum there. Um, so you have a piece of um, fish luster um, sort of on the right hand side and then various pieces of dragon and butterfly luster as well. And then in a similar theme to the miniature Portland vase, um, which set this entire talk off, there do seem to have been um, a series of commemoratives made for this trip to Australia as well. So my thanks to Colin and Judy Jones for sending me these. And I would be interested to know if anybody out there knows of a, a marked piece with an Anthony Holden back stamp on it from 1914, as per the Portland vase from 1913 from Chicago. But I do wonder if the plan was, because Wedge, um, Bernard was meant to travel and make further arrangements um, for future exhibition destinations once he was actually in Australia, that having a wider selection of pieces marked and decorated with various Australian state badges and, um, and cities might explain these a little more. What is certain is that Wedgwood was in this period making quite an array of uh, miniature pieces decorated with various British towns and cities badges uh, to be sold as souvenirs. So as Barnard travelled around, as this exhibition travelled around, perhaps these would have gone along with them, which is uh, certainly one idea. 
So to finally start thinking about wrapping this presentation up, uh, just to recap, we've explored both the reasons why Wedgwood was so keen to try and expand its export business at the very beginning of the 20th century, and ultimately by the 1910s, understand why Wedgwood was able to further consolidate its exports and undertake um, sort of efforts to sort of understand exactly what those particular markets wanted. Um, and it did so by combining both old and new goods, um, pulling on both sort of like the appeal of new material, but also the idea of heritage brand with this old collection of material. And I do wonder if it wasn't for the outbreak of the First World War that perhaps this formula may continued. Um, certainly in 1914, I found a reference to the Wedgwood Company appointing a travelling salesperson to develop the American market. Um, this would ultimately come to naught, but I do wonder if perhaps global events hadn't overtaken it. We may have perhaps seen Wedgwood being sent out to perhaps somewhere like Argentina or Brazil in a way that we did here with Australia and, and the US. And then certainly with the outbreak of the war, and I know many of you have heard me speak on the impact of the First World War um, on the company and um, to WIS on previous events, it left them in a very financial, uh, very precarious financial position. By the end of the year, the Wedgwood Company had made just, um, I think it was like £43 profit in 1914 compared to several thousand the year previously. And this could have proved utterly devastating. So the fact that actually it was a stroke of enormous good luck that in the two years previously, Wedgwood had actually undertaken these two particular events, had ensured that they would actually continue to have goods, um, a demand for goods going overseas, um, to the point at which Wedgwood was struggling to keep up with these orders, we can directly attribute to the Marshall Field Exhibition in 1913 and the Sydney Hold and the Anthony Holden's Exhibition in Sydney in 1914. And certainly as we begin to move into the 19 or the late 1910s and into the 1920s, Wedgwood begins to make a series of patterns designed to appeal directly to its American customers, pulling directly on the information it's getting from the US through both its um, employees out there, but by sending people out there as well to understand what they want. So final comments. Um, Wedgwood would continue to have excellent relationships with both the Marshall Fields um, Company and Anthony Holden throughout the 20th century, and they both remained important retailers um, for Wedgwood in their respective countries. Um, and indeed, um, it's actually interesting that Marshall Field continued to advertise that they'd been the host of this exhibition for a number of years afterwards. So I do hope that this talk has shed a little light on two perhaps underappreciated exhibitions. Um, and finally, I'd say thank you all for listening and my thanks to um, the huge number of people that have actually provided me with images and help and advice the last few weeks and months whilst putting this talk together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lucy. That was wonderful. We do have some questions in the chat, so I'm going to read those out for you, Lucy. So Rosalind Pretzfelder asks, are there any photos of the Chicago exhibition that you mentioned? Not that I've not found. Um, I'd, I'd really like to perhaps go and explore some of the American newspapers perhaps in greater detail. I do wonder if there was perhaps a, a write-up in there, um, but I, I've not been able to find any so far. So I think the pictures I showed of Sydney at the moment are about as close as we're gonna get to understanding what it would have looked like. Thank you. And then I had a question. Um, do you know the whereabouts of that lovely large Thomas Allen decorated swan vase that Ken Goldman asked if that was in the Paul Lauer auction? He did have a swan vase, but I don't believe it's the same one. Yeah. That's so I, I'd, I'd, I'd love to know that. Uh, I think there are probably quite a few people who would like to know that. Um, those things are huge. Um, 
I think they're probably about four feet high, so they're not exactly inconspicuous. Um, but no, I've I've no idea where that's going. From. Oh, Lucy, that's one person out there will go out and find it. Yeah, I wish we could, <laughs> Lucy. There is a. Maybe we've lost Susan. Oh yes, sorry. Um, in and out. Um, there is a swan vase in the art gallery in Adelaide. Whether or not it's exactly the same as the one you showed a photo of, I'm not sure, but there definitely is one. And I have a photo uh, that I took myself several years ago when I was in the city. I shall follow that one up, thank you. Adele Barnett asks um, or mentions about a decade or more ago, the Wedgwood plaque laden cabinet found its way to a New York sales room. Does anyone know where it finally landed? Is that the, that's the large display piece? Yeah, that was a, the it one. was a Carlton Hobbs. Yeah, I, I don't know time. beyond that, unfortunately, but other than it, it appeared, but no. I don't know if they sold it either, actually. No. It's, it's, a, it's, it's quite an interesting piece though, when you begin to sort of look at the, the quality and um, the variety of Jasper plaques that were inlaid into that. Um, yeah, clearly yeah. travel. Yeah, it's fascinating. Uh, Jeff Ruda asks, do you have a sense of how quickly design fashions changed in this period and how much of a new pattern Wedgwood had to sell to recover the costs of introducing it? Oh, I, I don't actually, that's a, that's a really interesting question. Um, I, I don't know is the honest answer to that. I'm sorry, Jeffrey. <laughs> question for another day. Yeah. Uh, Nancy Blaney asked, why did Wedgwood go to Marshall Field in Chicago first rather than New York? I think it was because they had that link with Chicago that they successfully exhibited in Chicago before because that was exactly the same question that floated across my mind when putting that talk together was they had rooms in New York, they had their um, sales director in the form of Kennard Wedgwood actually in New York, it makes sense to be in New York but they go to Chicago so I think it's because they actually had that idea that we've exhibited in Chicago at the International Exposition. This is a good place for us. We will do it here. So possibly they would have perhaps extended this. That's the idea of perhaps having further exhibitions down the line. They might have looked at going across America a bit further. But um, yeah, no, I can't find any definite proof because there isn't the, the records, unfortunately, that say exactly what the thought processes were behind this particular you know, trip. And Alan Landis confirms that the Thomas Allen Swan Vase is in the Adelaide Museum. Uh, they purchased it many years ago. So thanks, Alan. That's uh, great Thank to you. know. Uh, let me keep going. So Jeremy asks, oh, oh, I'm sorry. I think that's Yes, after World War II, Hensley Wedgwood organized a major exhibition at the Brooklyn Museum, yes, which featured old Wedgwood in the showroom and new Wedgwood in the store, marking a bit of a first. Do you think that he drew on this tradition of mixing the old with the new? I think so, yeah. So there was, I think there was a couple of exhibitions that sort of uh, later brought old and new together. I think this 1910, 19... 13, 1914 is when it, it really, when it really started. Lucy, the chat contains just many other well wishes and wonderful lecture. Thank you so much. It was fantastic. So I'll turn it back thank over much. to Lorraine. Thank you, Anne, and thank you, Lucy. And I would like to, on behalf of the Wedgwood International Seminar, thank each and every one of you for joining us today. And I want to let you know what's coming up in the near future. So our next meeting will be on Friday, April 16th, also at 2.30 Eastern time. And our speaker 
will be Gay Blake Roberts, who is the curator emerita and the, of the Wedred Museum. And she is also the senior research fellow attached to the research department at the Victoria and Albert Museum. Her title will be My Much Esteemed Friend, Some Aspects of Thomas Bentley's Life and Achievements. And on May 14th, our host uh, lecturer will be uh, Rebecca Klarna, who is the Collections and Curatorial Services Officers at the Wedgwood Museum. And her title of her talk is Therese Lasor at Wedgwood. And finally, our fifth lecture will be on Friday, the 18th of June. And Katrin Jones, who is the Chief Curator at World of Wedgwood, will speak to us. And the title of her talk is Wedgwood's Networks, a British Story, a Global Trade. Uh, specific information about each of these lectures will be sent in an email during the week of that lecture to each member. And it will also be listed on our website and on our Facebook page. And uh, um, David, if you wouldn't mind putting the slide up again so that everyone can see how to access some information. Um, while the lectures are free and open to the public, we hope that you'll consider jo joining the WIS. And you can see on this slide that you can go to our website at wedgwoodinternationalseminar.org and the link for the application is listed. And we were really hoping that if you would be able to support these lectures, possibly you would be able to give us a donation and the link for our PayPal to do that is there. So we're looking forward to seeing everyone in April and thank all of you for coming. It was a terrific lecture. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Ellis, behind the scenes. And thank you, David, behind the scenes.